do it then. So what's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Unconventional Money Moves podcast. I got Peter Fournier, not Fournier, on here today. And Peter agreed to come on because he has taken a unconventional, unorthodox way of building wealth and giving himself the time and the freedom to pretty much do what he wants every day. And you got your start like in insurance. Are you like running an agency now? Like what's your, what are you doing currently? Cause uh, I wasn't a hundred percent sure based on uh, our conversation prior to hopping on here today. Yeah. So I, I run a national agency. Some would call it an IMO, which is like an insurance marketing organization, but uh, we're in 43 States. We have about uh, 517 uh, insurance brokers uh, that work with us in partnership under life, annuities, Medicare, ACA, you name it. If it's in the life and health space, we sell it. Got it. And are you like running a team? Are you like just doing like operations? What exactly are you up yeah, to? So or, maybe, I, I, or, may, or maybe maybe you don't do anything anymore. I don't know. <laughs> one, one would wish. Soon, soon, soon enough. I'd probably get bored though, if that were the case. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm owner and CEO. Uh, so I started All Things Insurance Group uh, in 2021. Uh, like I said, we have a 500 plus team uh, across the country. I've been in the insurance space for 13 years, uh, selling. I was corporate for a while. I was captive for a while. And I uh, started this in November, basically to eliminate the friction for um, clients to obtain policies, first and foremost, and uh, agents to produce business. Gotcha. And so you just started not too long ago. What what caused that to happen? Was it just like you got bored or you just like, I feel like I could do it better? Yeah, uh, I was an agency manager uh, under an umbrella. So how insurance works is uh, typically there's someone above you uh, for most of the carrier contracts. And uh, I got an opportunity to become president of sales for an insurance marketing organization and uh, so I guess you could say I was like corporate, quote unquote, for like two and a half ish years. Um, it just wasn't for me. And uh, I, I basically restarted from the ground up. So we went from about 14 agents uh, when I formed the organization to about 517, 518 now. In less than a year, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, well, it'll be uh, it'll be two years in in November. Okay. Yep. And like, are you doing all this recruiting yourself? Like just you, like, or like, how are, how are you doing that in order to like attract so many people and at the same time, you know, yeah. not so, have like churn rate? Yeah. A lot of it in the beginning was me. Uh, I have a decent social media presence in the insurance space. Um, I've done a lot of like speaking gigs across the country related to sales and insurance. Uh, so a lot of it was me. Uh, and then probably around like 100, 150 agents or so, you know, insurance, like almost any sales organizations, a, a pyramid like anything else. Right. So you may have agents or agency managers underneath you that start onboarding people. So that counts everybody. Um, we have about 90 ish, 93 direct uh, to me and to the top of the organization. And then the rest kind of flow through that. Uh, but, yeah, I did uh, an extensive amount of uh advertising not necessarily paid advertising but a lot of marketing social media posts speaking gigs etc which attracted a lot of people to us and now um you know my sales managers and agency managers also recruit on our behalf too at this point that's cool that's yeah. awesome you're able to form your own thing and uh it seems like you probably did like all this work and then you're like well like you know I put all of this out there and you didn't reap the reward for uh, it seems like quite some time, but then you had laid out that foundation and eventually, you know, you had all these trees to sit under that give you a lot of shade because you formed all these relationships, did all the dark work and were able to have everything come together. So that's really cool. I've never like under really understood like why people get into insurance. It's like not something I would ever do, but like that, you know, just because it's not for me doesn't mean a lot of people aren't successful at it, such as yourself. Like, what is it about insurance that people really enjoy making it like a profession? Yeah, a couple of different things. One, like everybody needs it, right? At least here in this country, uh, you know, we don't have universal health care. Everybody needs life insurance. You need your uh, home and auto. Uh, you may want critical illness and stuff of that nature. So the prospect pool is uh, 
infinite. Um, you know, everybody between the age of zero, you know, because you can literally sell a newborn uh, to about 89 or 90 years old, arguably, is a prospect for you. So people make money doing everything, selling real estate, selling cars, selling big pens. But um, you you need a qualifier <laughs> to sell a Ferrari to somebody or sell a house to somebody or sell a house for somebody with insurance. Um, it's literally everyone is the prospect pool. So that's huge. First and foremost, second of all is the residual base. Um, I don't believe there's really, um, anything passive incomes, kind of like a facade. You still got to work for the damn thing, you know, but, uh, it's nice that if you put some hard work in for your first year, two years, three years, four years, et cetera, you continue to reap those rewards year in and year out uh, going forward. So those are the two major plays. Like the prospect pool is huge and uh, the residual income is is pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And what a lot of people don't seem to understand is like, oh, I want passive income because that means I don't have to do anything. It's like, well, in order to get the passive income, you have to figure out how to attract a client. And then once you attract the client, you then have to uh, keep that client happy so that you don't have to keep spending money to keep clients. And then eventually you could literally get your acquisition cost of a book of business to zero because you don't need to get new clients other than what you have and essentially just you know, compounding your growth from the inside out versus the beginning, you have to go the outside in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, residual income only comes if you can keep your client. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes, yes, for sure. Like I remember I bought health insurance and like I never heard from like the person ever. And then they like, I canceled my policy and they called me. I was like, bro, like I'm just going into the marketplace and I'm just like gonna go pick the best insurance possible based on what are my needs are. Um, so I mean, but life insurance is different because you actually need an agent or do you not? Because I see like, and hear things like on uh, the internet of like, oh, you can get this policy, sign up now, get a million dollars coverage, no medical exam. Like, how do, how has that been working out compared to like the traditional, like, you know, Peter calls me, he's my guy, he gets me what I need sort of deal. Yeah, a lot of the self-enrollment platforms, I mean, I, I'll, I'll give it to the people. They saw a gap in the space and try to capitalize on it, which is fine. I mean, the competition is only good for the industry that you're in, right? Um, but the, the problem with self-enrollment is it, no one knows what they need anyway. And like, obviously you could be misconstrued as like a, you know, a salesperson, you're trying to push a product on somebody, but I try to teach all my agents, like to use a really holistic approach because 99% of the prospects that we run into have no idea what type of life insurance coverage they need. They may have heard something or read a blog post or whatever, but when that time comes, whether you get, because there's living benefits and you can get paid if you get diagnosed with a critical chronic or terminal illness, there's obviously a death benefit. When that catastrophic event occurs, you want to have the right amount of coverage in place to cover your beneficiaries. And when we're selling, we're selling based on the beneficiary, not necessarily the insured. So I mean, we run across clients all the time that, hey, I self-enrolled and I bought this. Okay, what'd you buy it for? Well, I don't know. It sounded good. Okay. So, and it, it might've been the right choice. We don't know. Um, but I, we're not too worried in the space, at least for the time being of like the automated approach because most of the people are either underserved or they don't really know why they purchased the policy in the first place. Yeah, I mean, what is it? Like a... Uh... A bad watch could be right twice a day. So, I mean, you could pick the right policy. You could choose the right investment just because you get lucky. And it does happen. I mean, people who bought Bitcoin like 10, 15 years ago, like knew nothing about it. Like, and if they held it, they did pretty good. Mm -hmm. But I mean, sometimes you uh, just get lucky on those sort of things. But more times than not, when you looked at like the world as a whole, uh, it's a very small percentage of people that actually uh have those outcomes happen to and that was interesting because like i was actually talking to someone the other day and they had like a million dollars worth of life insurance and i was like why do you have this and they're like well something happens i want to pay off my mortgage and i'm like well how much is on your mortgage they're like well four hundred thousand. 
I'm like, well, what what are you gonna do with the other six hundred thousand? They're like, well, I don't know. And I was like, well, like maybe you don't need that much insurance. So like, how do, how do you figure out like what's the right amount of insurance for someone to have? Because like you, it's like you don't want to have too little. You don't want to have too much. You want to find that that sweet spot. Yeah, a good rule of thumb for anybody listening or viewing this right now is you, you would want to cover your mortgage, any outstanding debts that you have. So we incorporate like um, cars, boats, trains, planes, whatever you got. And then usually, unless like there's outlying circumstances, between like five to seven years worth of income is a decent rule of thumb. So if you have a $400,000 house, you're making a hundred grand a year, maybe in that uh, retrospect, you would need about a million dollars. Uh, you also have certain people like if we're dealing with an entrepreneur, it's long term lost wages, right? If I died now, what would happen to the company in terms of evaluation, revenue, et cetera? And what would happen to my family with the loss of me, right? So I'm projecting future revenue loss. God forbid something happened to me today. So I might be insured for like nine million dollars. You know what I mean? Um, as opposed to a million. So it all depends. And then we have seniors that are looking to just cover their burial or their cremation or whatever the case may be, because they didn't make great financial decisions throughout their life. And now they're looking for a small nominal policy where they don't want to use real dollars for real dollars in terms of prepaying. They want to use 30 cents on the dollar. So now they're buying a 20, 30, $40,000 burial policy. So the analysis is different from everybody. Granted, there are rule of thumbs out there, um, but each specific person situation, we have to customize it to them. We we can give them all the benchmarks in the world, but at the end of the day, it's all about their their family and what their fear of loss really is. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm, for sure. Is there like a crazy story that you can like recall when you were selling insurance that's like always stuck with you a little bit that you're like, man, that's something I'll never be able to forget? Uh, I've, I've had lots on the, uh, the door to door sales aspect. I did have a client in Northern Michigan that owned a wolf, which was pretty crazy. Uh, a pet, 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 wolf, pet wolf, pet wolf, and not like a wolf dog, like a wolf, like a full blown, big, scary wolf. We we're at the kitchen table. This, this had to be like 2011, 2012, we were at the kitchen table and I heard this thing howling and making noise outside. And it was like December, it was freezing, northern Michigan. And he, I was like, what the hell is that? You guys got wolves or coyotes out there or whatever? And he was like, well, I have a wolf. And I was like, what? So he took me outside and this monstrosity was chained to like a tree out there. And you could feed it, pet it. Like I touched the damn thing. It was terrifying. Uh, but yeah, I have some crazy fields. So I could go on for hours about field stories. Uh, of what you run into out there from <laughs> from day to day. Did uh, petting the wolf get you the sale? Oh, I definitely got that sale. That dude's still on the books too uh, for the <laughs> for the last decade, which is cool. Uh, but yeah, what a wild experience! Petting a wolf to to get a sale that is that's nuts. Yep. You don't yep. remember the wolf's name, do you? <laughs> no, I don't remember the wolf's name. <laughs> I remember just... I was I was in. Like basically Canada, though. That's how much north in Michigan I was in. Gotcha. So, like northern of Detroit. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, um, like Cadillac, Traverse City type uh, up there for anybody that's listening that knows where that is. Um, I know there's a casino up there that people go to, and that's about it. And it was freezing cold in December. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's definitely. Nowhere I want to be in December, uh, that's for sure. So basically, you're just running this agency right now, and you've attracted over 500 agents to this agency to sell, like final expense. You said basically everything, life insurance. Yeah, all um, life, Medicare, ACA, individual health care. We do some group benefits, uh, everything life, health, and annuities. So how do you, for yourself, like manage this? Like, have you, have you turned into like a delegator? Do you just like work 25 hours a day, eight hours a week or combo both? Like, how have you been able to manage that to get into your position currently? Yeah. I mean, sometimes like uh, today was like, is going to be definitely a seven to seven day, uh, which is crazy. And other days are shorter. 
but yeah, uh, the, the hardest part in basically constructing this company is giving away some of the power and hiring either W2s or empowering my sales managers, whatever the case may be, to take on a lot of the roles that I was doing myself for years and years and years. Um, and that's not an easy thing to let go of. But in order to grow uh, as an organization, you have to. Um, you got to be able to delegate and empower uh, people that work with you. And uh, you got to be okay with spending a shitload of money. <laughs> and yeah. those things are very important uh, to create a stable company. Well, you get no, without an investment, you get no return. Correct. So uh, it comes down to, and like for myself recently, uh, before for little girl, our little girl showed up not too long ago. I basically was like at the point of, well, I could hire people and I'm going to make less, which is going to suck. But you got to look at it as a reward, the reward of like, hey, like I'm making less. However, I have more time. And then eventually by making that investment, you will get a return on that investment, such as I'm sure you did a speaking engagement. And there was like not as many people as you'd like in the room. And that's OK. But those people follow you and then you're able to recruit them down the line. And it's it's weird how like people will just pop up all of a sudden. You're like, man, I remember meeting you. I hit up, hit you up, hadn't heard from you. And here you are. Yeah, 100 percent. How old's your uh, daughter? Uh, she is a little over two months. Oh, nice. Yeah, real fresh. Mine's uh, mine's nine months. Well, we'll be nine months in two days, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> yeah, you're just a little bit ahead of me. Yep. So yep. we're we're rolling through it, and I've I've found insurance very interesting because I've been doing a lot of uh, reading because I have I have like free time now, so I've been doing a lot of reading, and um, I can't I couldn't figure out how like Warren Buffett like got his start. Like everyone looks at him now, he's like super rich, but he's also like 92, and he's been working for a long time. But basically, like I'm starting to get into a little bit his like um, love for Geico insurance. And there's like these things about the premiums that I don't fully understand on how they work, but it has to do with something like the insurance company gets to hold the money and they're able to pay them out before they like, they pay them out to people or so, something like that. Is that anything that you know about, or is that something different? Cause like Geico is mostly like auto insurance. Yeah, we don't do much of PNC at all. Uh, but I mean, every insurance carrier is kind of a lot of large numbers. So the insured is paying their premiums. They're taking all the premiums together, whether it's uh, diversified into bonds, treasury notes, they're investing in the market, whatever the case may be. They're basically allocating all of your funds to be able to make money on their money to then pay out death claims, critical illness claims, et cetera. Um, so a lot of these companies, uh, it's public knowledge what they're invested in. They'll tell you on their financial report what they're invested in. That's where like the stability comes into play. Uh, a lot of the guaranteed returns come into play because if I'm showing somebody a guaranteed return of three and a half, four and a half, or in nowadays because the economy is in the shitter, six and a half or seven percent, uh, every once in a while a client's like, well, how's the insurance company make money? They are making double or triple trust me, on whatever premiums you're giving them. Uh, so that's how it works. Plus, you do have a lot of um, insurance that doesn't necessarily pay out. You look at like a term policy, which is needed. You know, you, you pay a little bit of money to cover a lot of bit of expenses or debt or potential income loss. And uh, I would say only about two, two and a half percent, if not less, of term policies pay out before they expire. So the insurance company is banking all that money right? Versus a permanent policy that's always guaranteed to pay out. Um, so yeah, they're just basically using law of large numbers to aggregate all these funds and then pay as the claims come in. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Like buying crazy business. Party, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, is it, so is this like, are you just working on like building this right now? Are you looking to start doing other things? I know sometimes people start to get bored of doing the same thing over and over. Um, I did see that you do like coaching and things like that. And you mentioned that you did speaking. Um, so I'm curious now that you're like starting to delegate, you you might once your your new new kid gets a little older, you might have some more free time when they start going to school. So like 
where do you see yourself going next in order to go from where you are to that next level? Yeah. So I, I started the coaching business in 2018, just at, at a whim because someone asked how much I would charge for like a half hour of my time to talk about like insurance selling. Um, and that propelled into a website and products and all this other stuff. So why I started that was mainly because there are some people out there that don't necessarily want to like move their contracts or, uh, you know, maybe their best friends with their current upline and it would make things weird, but they still need training. So you don't have to move and work with us per se. You can just pay me for my time and I'll teach you, you know? So we were doing that for a little bit. Um, I would say that it's only 15 to 20% of my total revenue. It's fun. I enjoy it. Uh, it's not a huge money maker. Um, I'd rather see coaches and stuff of that nature making money from what they're coaching in versus the coaching. Uh, if anyone's looking for a coach, it's a little weird when uh, coaching is 85% of their business. Uh, versus the business that they're actually trying to coach you on. Uh, but I'll digress off that soapbox. Um, so I'm doing that occasionally. I flip a watch or two, a uh, big watch guy. So I've been doing that. I used to play in uh, professional racquetball tournaments, not a big money maker, but I enjoyed it. And uh, my whole goal right now, depending on what happens in the next 10 years, would maybe to like continue to mentor, maybe write a book and uh, audition for a lot of musical theater shows post uh, pseudo retirement. So okay. tend to be more of a jack of all trades and and profit from my passion across like multiple lines of business. But this is the primary money maker right now. So do you sing, dance? Act? Yeah, yeah, all the above. Yeah, yeah. Used to do a lot more. I haven't done a show since I don't know, 2018, 2019. But uh, yeah, it was a ton of fun, passion of mine. I taught high school musical theater for a little while uh, from my alma mater. Uh, a lot of friends that are on Broadway, a uh, guilty pleasure of mine. <laughs> yeah. And that's, um, that's super cool. Cause uh, a lot of people don't, don't fully understand that. Like when you're in the arts, uh, some of it, if not a good portion of it could be like improvisation. So by being in business, you know, there are some people who are like, hey, like if you pay me $99, I'm going to give you the ultimate sales script so that you can start closing 10 insurance deals a week, guaranteed 90% close rate. But those scripts only get you so far mm -hmm. when it comes to actually be able to take a conversation that maybe isn't going down the road that you want it to and being able to pause and, you know, improvise. Because I'm sure you've been in a... um a show where something doesn't go according to how you rehearsed it. Cause the show's oh, yeah. live and the show must go on. You can't just say, Oh, sorry, we messed up. Let's uh, rewind the show for everyone. Yeah. It's uh, it, it, that's happened on numerous occasions, people forgetting lines or breaking stuff or whatever, but it also help, helps like truthfully in the entrepreneurial field or the sales field. Maybe you don't have your own business, but you know, you want to be a salesperson later on in life. I would encourage like, any middle school or high school or even college student join debate and join like some sort of theater improv. You may not sing, but just go do a play or something of that nature. Cause it'll help you tremendously in the long run. So what was your favorite show that you were in? Favorite show that I was in was probably beauty and the beast. Uh, I played Gaston and beauty and the beast. Uh, I also really enjoyed rent played Roger and rent twice. <laughs> oh man. I saw yeah. Rent when I was in like seventh or eighth grade and I was like watching it. I had no idea what was happening the entire time. And then like yeah. the next couple of days, like someone like asked her like, yo, wasn't that sad at the end? Like, I was like, what do you mean? And they're like, oh, like, you know, this person like at the end passed away in Rent. I was like, wait, someone passed away? Like, I didn't even know because like there's singing and there's dancing. And like, if you're not like into the arts and whatnot, it's like, it's a little hard to follow sometimes when they're singing everything. It's like not a normal conversation. Oh yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And rent's more of like, uh, I guess you would diagnose that a rock opera. So it's constant singing, you know, there's no real lines in it. So if you're not used to it or not following along completely. It could get a little confusing. I was definitely confused. <laughs> I, was def I, I was definitely confused. So like, is there any way to turn insurance into a show? Maybe you can write it. Yeah, maybe you can we, write it. Maybe you can write a show about insurance, like death of a salesman. 
Yeah, yeah. We we joke all the time. It'd be pretty funny to film a reality TV show, kind of like The Office or something of that nature, because uh, insurance can get kind of entertaining when you get behind the scenes. I don't know if anyone would want to listen to a musical about it, but uh, it, we see all things all day long, which gets kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, you got to jot those things down. And yeah. like, I'm sure you have enough material for some sort of sitcom. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> Well, awesome. And with with that, I mean, what's next for you? Like, are you looking to have people join your team? You said coaching is more of like a side thing. Um, anyone that's on here that listens to this that is interested in, in insurance, obviously you can hit up Peter and uh, I'll put all the links and everything in the in the description. Is there anything else, Peter, you want to drop before I let you yeah. roll and continue with your 18 hour day? Yeah, we're yeah, we're we're continuously scaling. If you're looking for a career in, in the insurance space, we are bar, bar none one of the best opportunities out there. Um, just be conscious of, you know, a lot of people see the money and the potential and flashy cars and watches and whatever the hell else we post, but it's important to really interview your mentor uh, or who's going to prospectively be your mentor and ask them, are they still working in the business? What got them there? What failures did they have? And then what kind of contract are they proposing to you? Because like any industry, there's a lot of scumbags in this one. Uh, so you don't want to be caught uh, you know, captive or uh, in serious non-competes or whatever the case may be. Um, so just be conscious about jumping feet first into really any sales industry before you do your due diligence. And Luckily, with social media and all the information on the internet and stuff like that, I mean, you can weed through the crap pretty easily. But uh, yeah, we're just continuously looking at scaling uh, what the next 10 years or so uh, looks like. I don't know, but I'm trying to grow this sucker to a $150, $200 million company. And then uh, we'll see what happens after that. <laughs> well, Warren Buffett still owns Geico, and he bought Geico over 60 years ago was his first investment and then eventually took it over. So from what I've been reading about the insurance is uh, if you can hold on to it, hold on to it as long as possible and keep it. Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. So, but thanks for coming on the unconventional money moves podcast. Thanks for everyone listening. We'll see y'all next time. Bye guys.